Hey everyone, welcome back to the channel. Today's video is about something that happened right in the middle of a party, and trust me, it, it wasn't fun. This massive JBL Party Box 1000 speaker, which belongs to one of my close friends, suddenly stopped working during a party. No sound, no lights, nothing at all it just went completely dead. You can imagine how that affected the mood. So in this video, I'm going to take you step by step through the process of how I diagnosed and repaired it. Whether you're a music lover, a technician, or just curious to see what's inside one of JBL's most powerful Bluetooth speakers stick around. I'll show you the tools I used, how I opened it up, what the real problem was, and how I fixed it without spending a fortune. Hopefully, this video will help you save your own speaker, or at least give you an idea of what to expect if yours ever fails. Before we jump into the repair, let me tell you a bit about this beast. The JBL PartyBox 1000 is one of the most powerful Bluetooth speakers out there. IT pushes out a massive 1100 watts of power, making it perfect for large parties and events. Inside, it's got a 12-inch woofer, dual 7-inch mid-range drivers, and a compression tweeter for crisp highs. It also has a built-in DJ pad for sound effects and loops, plus an LED light panel on the front that syncs with your music. And if that wasn't enough, it even comes with a gesture control wristband to change lighting and sound effects with your hand. This speaker doesn't run on battery, needs to be plugged in, that gives it more power. But when it fails, it's a serious problem especially during a party. Alright, now that you know what we're working with, let's get inside and see what went wrong. First, we connected the power and tried to turn it on, but there was no response at all. And no lights, no sound completely dead. Before removing any screws, make sure to take off all the rubber pads, they're hiding some of the screws underneath. Next, remove the screw cover sheet, there are 7 pieces in total. Use a needle or a small tool to gently lift them off. Once all the rubber pads, screw covers, and seals are removed, you'll see the screws underneath. Take your time and unscrew them one by one. Make sure to keep the screws organized some are different lengths and need to go back in the right spots. Be gentle but firm while unscrewing, especially around the plastic edges, to avoid cracking or stripping the holes. Use a magnetic screwdriver if you have one. It helps prevent losing screws inside the casing. Once all the screws are removed, carefully pull out the top cover. Be gentle as you lift it off to avoid damaging any internal components. Next, locate the connecting cable attached to the board. Unplug the cable carefully by pulling it out making sure not to tug on the wires or damage the connector. This will allow you to fully separate the top cover and begin accessing the internal components. Next, focus on the four screws securing the metal cover. Use a screwdriver to carefully remove each screw one by one. Keep the screws organized. It's a good idea to place them in a small container or on a magnetic pad. Once all four screws are removed, you can lift the metal cover off.
caulker screws are removed, you can lift the metal cover off. Be careful while handling the cover to avoid bending or damaging it. Now that we've removed the metal cover, we can clearly see the internal components of the JBL Party Box 1000. Right here is the power supply unit. This is where the AC power gets converted into the voltages needed to run the whole system. Next to it is the main board. This is the brain of the speaker. It handles Bluetooth, audio processing, light and control, and more. Now that we've seen the internal components, let's move ahead with troubleshooting. Since the speaker is completely dead, no lights, no sound our first suspect is the power supply. We'll start by checking if it's getting any input voltage from the main power cord, then, we'll test the output lines to see if the correct voltages are being sent to the main board and amplifier. I've now checked the DC voltage after the rectifier, and we're getting around 318 volts DC. That means the AC input is coming in properly and the first stage of the power supply rectification is working as expected. Next, I'm going to check the output side of the power supply. At this point, we should be getting standby voltage from the secondary side, even if the speaker is not fully powered on. Using the multimeter, I'll carefully probe the output lines. Standby voltage is important because it powers the main board's control circuits and lets the system detect when to turn on fully. If the standby voltage is missing, that could explain why the speaker isn't turning on at all. After checking the output side of the power supply, I found that the standby voltages are missing. In this JBL Party Box 1000, the standby lines should deliver 12 volts and minus 12 volt DC, but both are not present. That means the second stage of the power supply isn't functioning, even though we have 315 volts DC after the rectifier. This could point to a problem in the PWM controller, switching MOSFET, or maybe a failed component in the feedback or protection circuit. Without standby voltage, the main board can't start, and the speaker remains completely dead. To take a closer look and test the components properly, I'm going to remove the power supply board from the speaker. First, I'll carefully disconnect all the cables connected to the power supply make sure to note or label them if needed. Then, I'll unscrew the mounting screws holding the board in place. I'm carefully removing the power supply board now, so stay tuned and enjoy the video. After removing all the mounting screws, the power supply board is now loose. The next step is to carefully disconnect all the connectors attached to the board. Take your time don't pull too hard. Some of these connectors can be tight or fragile. And now the power supply board has been fully removed from the speaker. Let's take a closer look. From this angle, we can clearly see all the key components the main filter capacitor, switching transformer, MOSFETs, diodes, and the PWM controller IC. This close view helps us inspect for any visible damage like burnt components, cracked solder joints, or swollen capacitors. Alright, the power supply is now out, and it's time to diagnose the fault. We already know the 315 volts DC is present after the rectifier, but there's no 12 volts or minus 12 volts standby output. So now, I'll start checking the components one by one starting with the PWM controller, switching transistors, and other critical parts. Let's see what's preventing this board from powering up. Now on my workbench, I've connected the AC input to the power supply board. With all safety precautions in place, I'm carefully tracing the power flow across the circuit, starting from the AC input, through the fuse, rectifier, and filter capacitor, I follow the voltage path step by step. So far, 
Everything looks normal at the input stage. Before the rectifier, I confirmed that AC 230 volts is present at the input terminals of the power supply. Then, after the rectifier, that AC voltage is successfully converted to DC voltage measuring around 315 volts DC. Now that we've confirmed the input and rectifier stage are working, I'm going to check the output terminals once again just to be sure. Using the multimeter, I'll measure the voltage at each output pin to confirm if any of the expected lines like 12 volts, minus 12 volts, or plus 50 V are present. This confirms that the power supply is not delivering any output, despite having proper 315 volts DC at the input. So now, it's time to move on to deeper diagnosis. The first step in diagnosing the issue is to check for any short circuits on the board. For this, I'm using a multimeter in buzzer or continuity mode. When you touch two points and hear a beep, it means there's a direct connection or possibly a short circuit. I'll start by checking the output lines, power rails, and around key components like diodes, MOSFETs, and capacitors. If there's a short, the multimeter will beep continuously, which will help us quickly locate the faulty area. Let's begin scanning the board. I found a short circuit on the 12 volt DC output line. The 12 volts rail is shorted to ground. This is likely causing the power supply to shut down in protection mode. I will now check all components connected to the 12 volt line such as capacitors, diodes, and regulators to find the faulty part. I found the fault. There is a short circuit in the 12 volt output line. A pair of diodes is shorted. These diodes are connected to the 12 volt line. One or both diodes may be faulty. This is why the power supply is not working. It stays in protection mode to avoid damage. This faulty diode is marked as SRT5100. It is a Schottky rectifier diode. It can handle 5 amps and 100 volts. This type of diode is commonly used in power supply output sections. I will now remove and test it to confirm the fault. I have now opened one side of each diode from the circuit. This isolates the diodes for accurate testing. Now, I will check them individually using the multimeter in diode mode. I tested both diodes using the multimeter. One diode shows a voltage drop of 0.149 volts. The other diode shows 0 volts. This means the second diode is shorted and faulty. I tested the open diodes again using the multimeter in buzzer mode. One diode does not beep, which is normal. The other diode gives a beep in both directions. This confirms it is shorted and needs to be replaced. After removing the faulty diode, I left the other diode in place. Both diodes were originally in parallel to handle more current. Now. I'll test the functionality of the power supply with just the one diode. We should be able to check if the SU works properly with only one diode for now. After giving 230 volts AC power and testing, the output voltages are working fine. Both the 12 volts and minus 12 volt outputs are now present. The power supply is functioning correctly with one diode. Now, I'll proceed with replacing the second diode to restore full functionality. Both diodes have now been replaced with new ones. 
It's time to reassemble the power supply and put everything back together. I am now carefully fixing the power supply board back into the speaker. I make sure all screw holes are aligned properly. Then I tighten the screws one by one. Now it's time to confirm that the speaker is working properly. I will now connect the main operator panel to power on the speaker. This panel includes the power button and control interface. Once connected, I will turn on the speaker and monitor its behavior. Let's see if it powers up successfully. Wow, it's working perfectly after a big repair operation. The speaker powers on and all functions are back to normal. I'm really happy with the result. Now it's time to complete the final assembly. Now, fixing the metal cover back onto the speaker, I align it properly and secure it with all the screws. This protects the internal components and completes the main reassembly. Now, I net the ribbon cable of the main operator panel. Then I carefully fix the panel back in place. I make sure the connection is secure and the panel is properly aligned. Now, fix all the screws back in place. I make sure everything is tight and secure. The speaker body is now fully assembled. Now, I fix back all the plastic and rubber screw covers. I place each cover in its original position. This gives the speaker a clean and finished look. If you enjoyed this repair, please subscribe for more tech fixes. The speaker is now completely assembled. Everything looks perfect and works smooth. Now, it's time to enjoy the music and celebrate the successful repair. I hope you enjoyed my video and got some ideas about the repair. Please subscribe to my channel for more repair videos in the future.